So, moving along. Uh, this passage that we read is a uh, really a passage that is going to come to full and final flowering in the New Testament. Uh, this passage in chapter number two of this prophetic book, the prophet uh, Habakkuk, he is going to say something that will become foundational in the church age. And that is um, his statement he makes a little bit later on in the passage, but the just shall live by faith. Say it with me. But the just shall live by faith. So let me give you the context. Write the vision down, the Lord says. Write the vision down. Make it plain on tablets, the Lord says, that he may run who, who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. God has given you a vision that is for an appointed time. Uh, but at the end, it will speak and it will not lie though it tarries wait for it it will surely come and he goes on to say but the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith now the apostle paul when he is writing the systematic theology of grace and and uh this church age foundation uh stone of of grace and salvation through faith in jesus christ and how christ has become our covering our our perfect lamb of god for sinners slain he is going to reach back to the this passage, and he is going to choose this passage as a full explanation of how we Christians ought to live in this life on this planet. He's going to say in the book of Romans, the just shall live by faith. This theme is going to recur over and over through the book uh, or the books of the New Testament. It's not just Paul in the book of Romans. He's also going to foundationally build upon faith in the book of Galatians. The author of the book of Hebrews is also going to point this out. Hebrews chapter number 11, he's going to give us a list of flawed, imperfect people. Why does that matter? Because all of us here uh, fit in that kind of a category. A list of flawed, imperfect people who did exploits. How did they do it? They didn't do it through the law. They didn't do it through a talent in themselves. They did not do it through great abilities of their own making. They did not even do it through their own goodness or their own righteousness. How did they do exploits? They did it through faith. Somebody say through faith. Through faith they overcame. Through faith they rose above. Through faith they cast off the chains of oppressors. Through faith they were delivered from the mouth of lions. Through faith, through faith, through faith. The just shall live by faith. I'm I'm here to tell you, you're going to make it. I'm here to tell you, you're going to make it. You know how you're going to make it? You're going to keep believing. You're going to keep believing. I said, you're going to keep believing. 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 You're going to keep believing when you're tired. You're going to believe. And when you're weary, you're going to believe. And when you're lonely, you're going to believe. And through faith, it's not going to be your power. It's not going to be your power, your glory, your goodness, none of that. It's going to be through faith. The just shall live by faith. But this writer in this same passage, he says a strange thing here when he, when he emphasizes the necessity of this prophet to write the vision down. God speaks to people through dreams and, and visions. This is not simply something that is true for us today. Uh, it is very much the most common manner uh, in the scripture of God speaking to people. The most common common manner is God to speak. When he speaks specifically to a person, he will do it through a dream and a vision. Now, I want to remind all of you that we have the canonical, the broad word of God through the Holy Scripture. Can I have an amen? You should spend more time seeking God's plan, God's will, God's blessing through the Holy Scripture than you do seeking to hear a voice. God's given you 66 books. You ought to spend time in them. He's given you 66 books. You ought to study. You ought to pray. You ought to, you ought to submerge yourself in the ocean of that word of God. It's established it's forever settled. Not one bit of it is going to pass away. It is strong. That is the word of God. That is the 
primary source of direction in our lives. Yes? yes? Thank you very much. So, however, we are given at times and seasons, we are given dreams and visions. Some people have heard an audible voice. Um, I've always I've always wanted to have some experience like that myself. I've had, I've had some supernatural experiences, but I, I've never heard an audible voice. Um, if you look in the scripture, the most common way for people to have uh, a message from heaven is dreams and visions. Abraham in Genesis 15, Abimelech in Genesis 20, Jacob in Genesis 28, Joseph in Genesis 37, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker in Genesis 40, Pharaoh himself in Genesis 40, 41, Samuel in 1 Samuel 3, uh, Judges 7 shows us the dreams, the work of dreams and visions. Solomon in 1 Kings 3 says, has a dream where the Lord asks him to make a request and he makes his uh, famous and celebrated requ request for godly wisdom. Daniel in chapter number 2, Zachariah, Zacharias in Luke chapter number 1, Joseph in Matthew chapter number 1, Pilate's wife in Matthew 27, Ananias, Acts 9, Cornelius, Peter, Paul, John, and on and on and on. We see them receiving direction in dreams and in visions. And once we are given a path, once we are given a dream, once we are given a vision, uh, that is not, believe it or not, that is not the hardest part of serving God. The dream and the vision is not the hardest part. Uh, you uh, will find there's something harder than receiving a dream, uh, and that is keeping the dream alive. Yeah. Now, I want you to think about this a little bit. The Lord gave this to me on Monday morning. I try to sleep in on Mondays, but sometimes it doesn't work, doesn't work out that way. And I woke up, and I went downstairs, and I, I was spending some time with the Lord, and the Lord spoke seven things to me, not in an audible voice, but in my spirit, spoke seven things into my heart that was for me. And I thought it was just for me, so I, I wrote them down. Uh, I always pray. Uh, I always pray with a notebook uh, because I want to write it down. Uh, I always will make that a part of my of, of my time with the Lord. And uh, so I wrote these seven things down uh, for myself. It was later in the week that I felt the unction of the Lord that I should share it with all of you because I want to be I want to be honest and I want to be uh, vulnerable and I want to be transparent and I want to tell you it's much easier to get a vision for God than it is to keep a vision for God. It's very difficult at times to keep the vision that God has has given you. So the first thing I want to say to you, the first thing I want you to get in your spirit is this. We have been given a spiritual guide, a spiritual comforter, and a spiritual evidence of God with us, and that is the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. You are going to have a hard time walking in God's purpose and in God's blessing if you haven't the Holy Spirit working in you, for you, and through you. I want you to see how the disciples first had this kingdom of heaven presented to them. Uh, three and a half years of learning and now they are ready to receive this gift of heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, there's this wind that blows. It's a, called a rushing mighty wind in the scripture. It fills all the house where they are sitting. They receive the gift of tongues in their life. Now they had already been with Jesus but they had never had tongues in their life. They had never spoke with tongues. They, they had already had moments moments of God's presence and God's power, but they did not have that experience for themselves. But on this day, they had the experience of the Holy Ghost upon them. It changed them. Now, Jesus had been with them for three and a half years. Lots of people don't get the Holy Ghost immediately. It's, it's very common for people to seek. You need to repent, and you need to fit, repent until you're finished repenting. I don't want to rush you past your repentance, and then you need to learn how to be comfortable in praise and worship. If you're not comfortable in praise and worship, it's going to be rather difficult for you to experience tongues. The disciples, even after they had been with this Lord for three and a half years, they had to tarry for days. They had to pray 
for days. Now, it's not that difficult when you have someone who can help you and encourage you to know what is happening to you. But I want you to know the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues, and let me be clear, tongues is not the Holy Spirit. Tongues is the sign that God gives you that his Holy Spirit is taking up residence within you. I want you to see this. I want you to get this. Tongues is not for God. God knows if you have the Holy Spirit. Tongues is not for the angels. Uh, Tongues is for you. It's so you can know that you have God's promises working in your life. Do you see what I'm saying? So if you have a passion, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, the first thing I want you to receive, I want you to get working in your life is the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you have questions about that and you have things you want to ask, come to the third lesson of first first steps. That's the one where I talk about uh, what it means to receive the Holy Spirit, what it means to have these experiences. But I want you to know, first of all, it's God's gift. It's never presented any other way in the scripture but the gift of God. That's the biblical word that is used. It is for you, and I believe you can receive it. Can I have a big amen? How about all my Holy Ghost filled people? How about all my Holy Ghost filled people? It's the greatest thing that can happen in your life. I said it's the greatest thing that can happen in your life. It'll give you joy for the journey. It'll put a shout down in your heart. It'll put the joy of the Lord. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you don't come from a background where they talk like that, or, or God forbid, you've been told something crazy like it's of the devil. Uh, I hope no one's ever told you that. That'd be that mean the whole book of Acts was of the devil. So um, that would be crazy. Um, I want you to know, first of all, it's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be worried about. It's not going. To, God's not going to take possession of you and force you. It's a very natural thing. Happens through worship and faith. Uh, and we can talk about that. Come to my third lesson of first steps. We talk about receiving the Holy Ghost and all that good stuff. Um, But so I want you to see, if you have the Holy Ghost, it is of great advantage to you because the Holy Ghost is going to guide you. Can I have an amen? The Holy Ghost is going to comfort you. Can I have another big amen? The Holy Ghost is going to convict you. And honey, you need conviction. Tap your neighbor, say that was for you. You need conviction. And so... uh, the, the, The sad thing, however, is we can lose our way so bad that... Even people who have received the Holy Ghost lose their vision. And they crawl into a kind of a dark place, and they, they, they suffer there. And I, I want to say, first of all, it doesn't make you a bad person. I've been there. In fact, if you'll look on the upper left side of the cell, you'll see Nathan was here. I carved that in that dark spot. And so <laughs> and so I want you to see that it, it, it's not the will of the Lord for you to stay there. Um, you have to get your vision. Uh, God has designed you with a certain set of talents and gifts, and he's designed you to be knit together with others. You'll see scripturally, vision uh, is always, it's almost never about a person for the person to their benefit. It is really about that person's ministry to others, what God is going to use them to say and do and represent to others. If your vision is always isolating you, then you may have more of a mental health issue than you have a spirituality issue. I'm serious. God's intent is for you to have a word, a blessing, uh, encouragement, a gift for somebody. And so, and so you need a vision and you need to be able to maintain that, maintain that vision because if you do not do that, then it's always slipping through your hands. I want to tell you this truth, vision leaks, it leaks. You fill your heart with vision and it leaks out and you have to refill it because it's leaking out. You have to refocus because it's leaking out. You have to do that. You see, sight is a function of of our eyes while vision becomes a function of our spiritual heart. Vision is not what God is doing. Vision is what God will do. Vision is the ability to see further than your rational mind can think. And you can see what you have no idea how God can do, but you can see that God will do it. Vision is an act of faith where the unseen
unseen becomes visible and the unknown becomes possible. You need a vision because God's going to encourage you, guide you, strengthen, and bless you through vision. God doesn't speak to you about where you are. God speaks to you about where you're going. I'm not talking about location. I'm not talking about location. I'm talking about God's purpose in your life. God doesn't speak to you about where you are. God speaks to you about where you're going. Look in all those vision passages of Scripture. Don't have time today. All those vision uh, passages of Scripture, vision is always about where God is taking you. And vision, hear me, vision is not about what you can do. It's about what God can do through you, and that's not the same thing. Vision is about what God can do through you. I said vision is about what God can do through you. So the issue does not become what you can do. It does not become your abilities. It becomes your ability to submit yourself to God and let your dreams be as big as your God, not as big as your bank account. Let your dreams be as big as your promise as not as big as your personality. Your dreams must be bigger, bigger, bigger. Why? Because your God is is bigger, bigger, bigger. I said your dream needs to be bigger because your God is bigger. Recently, there has been some very difficult uh, stories in the news. There's been some difficult stories that I have heard that has broken my heart. This past week, a pastor in California uh, committed suicide. Um, he, 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 I'm sure he was a good man. I, I can't speak to that, and I don't want to because I don't want to be unfair. I do know good people can get to such a point of mental illness, of such a point of mental discomfort and, uh, and health where they make this, con- this ongoing series of bad decisions. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I always tell myself uh, not to make big decisions when I am very, very upset in my in my spirit. Because you almost always make bad decisions when you're strung out. Can I have the big amen? And so he, uh, good men, good women can make this really bad decision. And he, here's a man preaching Christ, a man who says that Christ can heal every Sunday, a man who says that Christ loves you every Sunday, and he he com- commits this tragic uh, act of of suicide. And it's not just uh, the church at large that can have this happen. We've actually had, as sad as it is to say, we've, we've had people filled with the Spirit uh, who got so unhealthy in their mind and so broken in their heart that they uh, made that ultimate bad decision and left their children and their family and their loved ones to grow up uh, without them. It is a tragedy and it is a sin, uh, but we extend love and grace to broken people. It's a lot of times a hard, it's easy if somebody has a physical problem we see. If you have a broken arm, then everybody understands that. But if you're fighting with something that's broken in the chemical structure of your brain, people don't understand that. I believe God's a healer. I'm going to believe it till my dying day. Uh, And I want you to find a place of spiritual healing. I want you to find a place of hope and victory. God will give you a vision, but the hardest thing you will do in your calling and in your work and in your ministry is going to be uh, to maintain a vision that God has given you because getting a vision is easy. It's the keeping and the care and the maintenance and the feeding of the vision that gets hard. A few weeks back, one of our Bible school students came home from Bible school and in a terrible moment of bad decision making, took his own life. Here's a young individual who is supposed to be the next level, the next generation of ministry, the next generation of spiritual hope, and he gets at such a place of brokenness that he can see no escape easier than that one. I'm here to tell you, God will give you a vision, but you have to work to maintain that vision. If you if you don't know how you can work for the Lord, I want to I want to encourage you first of all in this way. If you come through our, our first steps, uh, the fourth lesson of that, we do a personal personality analysis of you, and we will connect you with ministry leaders in the church where you can find a place of service. You will not be spiritually fulfilled without service. You must serve in order to discover what it means to carry a cross of spiritual purpose. The cross is not a symbol simply of suffering. It's a symbol of purposeful suffering for the joy set before him. It's not just the suffering for the sake of suffering. 
You need to find a place to give back. You need to find a place to serve others. As a church, we want you to be knit together with us. That's why we open our heart to you. That's why we open our time to you. We want you to be knit together with us. We want you to find a place of ministry. We want you to connect your abilities, your talents to a body of Christian effort that the Lord will bless for a purpose beyond simply each of us as individuals. And so we want to do that, but the Lord will give you that. If you if you don't really have a place yet, uh, we're just starting a new semester of small groups. Uh, this is a great way for you to get to know people, a great way for you to make connections, make friendships, find other people, discover people with similar burdens, and then that turns into not simply a small group of fellowship, but a small group of ministry. And you may have started playing games, and in six months you might be uh, visiting uh, the children's hospital, loving kids in this wor the worst days of their life. And I'm saying this is how vision is discovered. God will give you a vision. You're going to have to fight to maintain that vision. Monday morning in my prayer time, the Lord, as I was as I was uh, communing with the Lord, I, 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 the Lord spoke seven things to me that I needed to do to maintain my vision that I needed to do. And I initially did not think I would preach it to you, but here I am because the Lord has so directed me. The first thing the Lord spoke to me to say was write down the vision. Somebody say, write it down. Yes. Why do we have to write it down? Because, honey, your life works all time, full time, over time to make you forget about what God's mission is for you. You are filled with distraction. You are filled with fear. You are filled with anxieties. You will forget the mission, the vision. And so I have a word from the Lord for everyone here today. Would you like to run with the Lord. I don't mean crawl from Sunday to Sunday. I don't mean barely make it from service to service. I mean, would you like to run? Get yourself a pen and paper and write the vision down. And the Bible says, make it plain. I said, the Bible says, make it plain so that you may run. I'm not just staggering along. I'm not just holding on with Jesus. It's not just me and two or three others. No, 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 no. I am running the race that God has given me. Write it down. Multiple places in the scripture, you will see the Lord giving the command to write down the words, write down the vision, write down the prophecy. You will see this repeatedly. I love this passage because it ties together with the just shall live by faith. Why do we need to write it down? Well, let me, uh, I love to do this when I'm trying to be uh, structured in my thinking and not just kind of ride my kayak along a river of emotion. I like to be structured in my thinking. So I ask myself, okay, so the Lord is telling us us, uh, that we should write down the vision. Isn't it interesting that God never asks us to write down our fears? Amen. Why? You will never have a hard time remembering your fears. Amen. You carry your fears in your hip pocket and then quick draw. You don't need to write your fears down. You never need to be reminded of your fears. You don't have to write down your anxieties. You don't have to worry about your anxieties. Honey, they are worried about you. Amen. You don't have to kill. write that down. That is what you're good at. Let me tell you what you have to write down. You better write the vision down. That's not what you're good at. You have to work to keep the vision in the forefront. Write it down. Your fears will always be with you. But if you don't write down the visions, you will end up spending more time afraid than you do pursuing vision. And if you want to run toward God's vision, you better write it down. That's the first thing we've got to do. We've got to write it down. We've got to make it a part of our devotional life. That's one thing that happens when we write it down. When you write it down, you can make it a part of your devotional life. Every day when you pray, you need to let the vision be part of the prayer that you are praying. Every day when you spend time with God, you need to let that vision wash over you again. Why? Because if you don't write it down, you'll remember your fears and you'll remember your doubts, but you will not remember the vision. Yeah. 
The second thing you're going to have to do, I know I'm just imparting some things to you here today, but this is what is in my spirit this week. The second thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to expect and embrace difficulty. There will be struggle along the way. Uh, so often, so often we pray and we say, God, open the door for us. You know why we say that? Because what we're really saying is if it's too hard, I'm not going to do it. Man, I just killed the spirit with that, didn't I? I was like, we were flying along. We say, Lord, open the door. That's code language for Lord, make it easy. Open the door, Lord. Make it easy. Make it easy. If you'll make it easy enough, I'll do it. <laughs> My little girl, uh, she's, she's four years old. Uh, she's been raised in such this, such an affirming environment, uh, such a, a affirming and a loving environment. Not just me and her mom, although we're nuts about her, uh, but her her grandparents, also her daycare, uh, the lady who does her in daycare. She's been so affirmed that she's in this habit of affirming herself now, and it makes me laugh so hard. And so I took her and uh, her brother to the park, and um, I told them I told them to run around the park because you know kids nowadays are all about computers and they need more exercise. So I go out there, I say, run around this playground, okay? So my son looks at me like, really, just shoot me now. He's like, Jesus, take me. Jesus, take me, you know? And my little girl, she's like, oh, yippee, yay, yippee, yay. She's like, okay, daddy. And she takes off running. And she, just, she was three at the time. Just a little old thing running with her big bow bigger than her head and her hair, you know? And her skirt just flying around behind her. She's just running. She makes that first lap. She makes that second lap. She makes that third lap. She's getting tired. My son quit after a lap and a half because he's too cool for school, you know. She's still going four laps, five laps, and then she's getting tired, but she doesn't stop, and she starts encouraging herself out loud. As she runs, she says, don't be tired, Ettery. You can make it, Ettery. Don't be tired. You can make it, Ettery. And she comes by me, and she said, <laughs> Don't be tired, Ettery. You can make it. You can make it, Ettery. That's what she calls herself. Don't be tired. 22 laps. She ran around saying, Don't be tired, Ettery. You can make it. You can make it, Ettery. Make sure I was seeing her. Don't be tired. I want to preach to some of you today, and I want to tell you, you can make it. Don't be tired. Don't be tired. You can make it. God sees what you're doing. God sees how you're praying. Don't be tired. You can make it. Expect difficulty. And be committed to rediscover your vision after you've gone through difficulty. Peter was the first one to get a vision of, a, of a, a, a sheet coming down from heaven filled with unclean things. It was a prophetic moment where God is ushering in the Gentiles. And uh, the Lord says, do not call unclean what I have cleansed. But Peter had a hard time keeping that. And just a few, just a few uh, uh, years later, uh, Paul, is, uh, uh, Paul and Peter working among the, among the Gentiles, and Peter has begun to draw away from the Gentiles. And they get into this, this moment where Paul actually uh, calls Peter out, saying, and look, you can't just fellowship with Jews. I know, I know you get less criticism when you just fellowship with Jews. And I, I know there's no trouble in the church if you just fellowship with Jews. But look, Peter, you're the guy who got this started. <laughs> you saw the vision. You've got to spend time with the Gentiles too. And so Peter, how do we know he took the rebuke? Well, his missionary journeys continue to include Gentile nations. That's how we know he took it. And so I want you to see all of us can lose our vision and then we have to get it back. All of us can have a purpose and lose it and then get it back. This is what the, uh, the apostle Peter shows to us when he does not end his ministry to the Gentiles and simply go back to Jerusalem to stay. Vision will suffer struggle. You may have to fight for it. You may have to find it, but it will be the continued direction of God in your life. Other people may fail to see your vision. They may not appreciate your vision. Paul was killed because of his vision.
vision, expect it. If Paul went through it, if Peter went through it, if Jesus went through it, our vision will come at a spiritual price. Expect it, but remind yourself it is your honor to pursue the vision that God has given you, and it is your honor, even in persecution, even in trouble, even in suffering, it is your honor to work for the Lord. Number three, when you pray, this is how we keep our vision. Number one, write it down. Number two, don't be surprised by difficulty. Expect difficulty. I want to say again on number two, difficulty does not mean you're out of the will of God. Yeah. Difficulty does not mean you've blown it. Difficulty does not mean any of those things. We can't be the people who will do it if it's easy. And number three, ask yourself on a regular basis, not what you should do for the vision, but what would you do if you were truly courageous? See, there's different versions of you, and you know this. There's the timid version of you that wants to go home and hide behind a book. That's me. And then there's the bold version of you that wants to go and show somebody God's love. And so often we settle for the fearful version of ourself when the vision beckons us and the vision calls us forth and the vision challenges us and the vision reaches to us and the vision calls us. I would like you to ask yourself on a daily basis. Remember, you've written the vision down. You've made it a part of your devotion. You expect it to cost. You expect it. You know, this. look, this walk isn't a freeway. It's a toll road. Yeah. Sometimes you have to pay your way. <laughs> number three, number three, ask yourself what you would do if you were courageous. Don't ask yourself, what am I going to do today? Ask yourself, what would I do if I really believed the promises of God? Oh, you'll get a different answer. <laughs> what would you do if you were bold? What would you do if you believed that you truly were speaking as a man or a woman of God, a man or a woman of faith? Ask yourself what the best version of you the strong version, the brave version, what that individual would do. Number four, you have to communicate to yourself and to others the why on a, on a daily basis. You wrote it down. You made it a part of your, of your devotions. Uh, that's number one. Number two, you expected difficulty. Uh, num number three, you asked what you would do if you were bold and strong and brave. Number four, communicate to yourself the why. The why is the overarching reason. Uh, it's not the, the what, it's not the how. It is the motivating factor. Communicate to yourself and to others the why every day. If your vision is to be a home Bible study, you need to pray the why into your spirit. God, you've placed me in this world to make a difference, and if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And if not now, when? souls are dependent on me. I've prayed the why into my spirit. You will find bravery and courage and spiritual strength begin to flow through you as you pray the why into your spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to remind yourself the why on a regular, a regular basis. This isn't just true spiritually. The Lord places talents upon us that are according to his will and his destiny for us just as spiritual things are a part of his will and his destiny. I believe that people in this church have been blessed of God in certain areas of career, in certain areas of business, because I believe through that gift that God has placed in you, there is also a spiritual empowerment that comes because you are able to have the gift of giving. One of the spiritual gifts listed in the New Testament, along with the gift of time, of, of tongues, along with the gift of prophecy, along with the gift, gift of the word of knowledge, 
is a gift of giving. It is, it is mentioned in the New Testament. Some of you, because of God's investment in you, are being set up to be able to be and have and celebrate that spiritual gift of giving in your life. Some of you need to think about going back to school. You had an initial dream. You had an initial career goal, and then you let stuff happen. Some of you need to think about what your business is doing or whether or not you should be in business. Some of you need to get a, res uh, a resume out there and give God a chance to bless you. Because that was part of God's investment and destiny for you. God did not simply send Abraham to, e to Egypt to, to have a bad experience with his wife. God made Abraham rich in e Egypt. So I want you to see how the callings of God are of most important essence. They are the spiritual. But God uses everything else in our life to bring about a spiritual purpose and call and blessing. So let me get back on my notes here. You're going to tell yourself the why. You're going to tell yourself the why. You're going to pray the why back into your spirit. Don't, don't spend a whole lot of time suffering over the how in your prayer. You pray. Pray the why into your spirit and let God lead you to the how. So number four, always put back in your spirit the why. Number five is study the how, but remember the how can change. Uh, if you will study the how, you will find people that know how to do it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to find somebody who can teach you the how. Now, part of their how won't match your personality. So you will seek, 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 and you'll knock, 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 and then you will find, find, find. You will find your how, but the how can change. Hear me today. Uh, uh, my, my purpose uh, of being in this city, my purpose of being in this church is to influence as many people as we possibly can toward the gospel of Jesus Christ in our community. That's going to happen through worship. That's going to happen through instruction. That's going to happen through prayer. It's going to happen through devotion. It's going to happen through the five functions and purposes of the church, but it is all going to be ultimately for the kingdom of heaven. Can I have a big amen? That is the what. The why is because that's why God, we're here. That's why God ordained us. That's the why. The how can change. If you show me that we can reach people by selling M&Ms, tomorrow I will be selling M&Ms in Charlotte. I will do anything short of sin to reach this city. I do not love church more than I love God. Amen. If you tell me we can increase our visitors by 10% by putting balloons on the top of the church, I want to know where the helium bottle is. Amen. Why? Because the how can change. The why and the what, that is not what changes. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the what. The kingdom of heaven is the what. The why is souls that need to be reached for the kingdom. How we get them here. Honey, if you got a better idea than I do, let me hear it. We give away backpacks. We give away tablets. I meet parents. We invite people. We have small group. If you have a better how, I will study Come on. the how. But I'm praying the why into my spirit. I've got to write the vision down. I've got to keep that at the forefront. Or the enemy's going to come along and get me discouraged and get me filled with doubt and fear. And I am going to lose the vision. I'm almost done. Musicians come play and soothe everybody and calm them all down. Let them have hope that I'm not preaching two hours today, even though I really am. So number four was you've got to communicate the why to yourself and to others. Number five, study the how. We'll try, we'll try everything there is to try. We'll make failure our friend. Failure isn't failure, it's just information. <laughs> I said failure is just information. You business owners, something failed, try something else. You guys trying to have uh, careers, great careers and opportunities, try something else. Failure does not mean you're a failure. It means you have the guts to get out there and try something. And don't worry about the people who sit in their little enclaves of safety and criticize you. Don't worry about them. All they are are voices. They're voices. They're voices. Try 
Try. Put yourself out there. Try. Number six. Invest in people who get it. Invest in people who get the vision. Surround yourself with people who get the vision. Now, we all of us have in our life, we have the people that God has knit us with for the purposes of the kingdom of God, and then we have the harvest field. We do not need the harvest field to get it. They are the target. But we can surround ourselves with people who understand and they are fellow travelers in the vision. And so if you want to be a successful Bible study teacher, the best thing you can do is find another one and speak faith one to another. If you want to be powerful in prayer to people you don't know, you need to come hang out with Annette. That's what you need to do. You need to say, Sister Annette, now tell me how you did it. Hey, I I did it. Well, I just asked if I could pray. Well, let me see if this works. Do you mind if I pray with you? She'll be like, yeah, try it. That's all you have to do. You find somebody else. And then being built up one and another, you're able to go out to your target. And lastly... And this is one of the most difficult ones. And I know this is an impartation message. I'm not, uh, I'm, 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 I'm giving you something to, to chew on here. Uh, number seven, you need to find a way to make an ally out of patience rather than an enemy. Amen. Out of patience. Patience is one of the hardest things. Somebody say, oh, enough already. <laughs> <laughs> patience is hard. How do we make patience an ally rather than an enemy? Now, I want to remind you, this is the Lord speaking to me early Monday morning. How do we make patience an ally rather than an enemy? First of all, you need to remind yourself that maybe the value of what you're doing is bigger than you're giving it credit for. Because high value things don't happen overnight. Amen. Amen. Do you see? High value things don't happen overnight. They don't just boom, poof, done. Oak trees do not grow in a day. It takes time. Amen. That's number one. Number two, do not offer anything but your absolute best. This is how you make an ally of patience rather than an enemy. You know what we're guilty of doing so often? We're guilty of judging the crowd and making the effort we give equal the value of the crowd we have. And so if it's just you and two or three people, you know, you don't prepare for that. You just, it doesn't matter. The crowd's not very valuable. Do you see? And then sometimes you feel like, oh, some big names are going to be there. I better do my best. No. You don't know when God's going to discover you out of your little hidden place. You don't know when you are going to have an opportunity to impress somebody. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Remember the story I told you about the craftsman at the building of the Parthenon, and he was very religious, and he was designing the faces that were in that the, 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 the front of that Parthenon. And uh, he finished the sculptures on the back of the sculptures, too, not just the front. And they asked him why. They said, no one will ever see the back of the sculptures. No one will ever see. Why would you finish them? He said, oh, oh, you're wrong. Someone will see. God will see. And I do the back just as beautiful as the front. The front's for you. The back is for God. That touches my spirit. Because if we commit to excellence as unto the Lord and get out of the business of who's there and whether or not we should try, if we commit to excellence, we allow God to shine a light on us whether we know there's a big crowd there or not. You see what I'm saying? And so very quickly, and then we're going to pray together uh, here today. Number one, write it down. 
your fears are closer to you than your vision. You carry your fears, but you have to remind yourself of the vision. Write it down. Embrace difficulty. It's coming. That's two. Three, ask yourself what you would do if you really were strong, if you really had faith. Number four, communicate the why of your vision to yourself and to others regularly. Study the how. Don't spend years reinventing something somebody else has already perfected. Number six, invest in people who get it and spend your time investing, loving, uh, joining together with others uh, who can help you in the vision. And number seven, make an ally of patience, not an enemy of patience. Make an ally of patience because this is what I know. And I know I'm preaching longer than normal today, but I should have, I should have frequent flyer miles built up of not taking too long. And so I, I get a pass on this today. I want you to hear me today because if you don't keep the vision, the preacher can't keep it for you. The neighbor on your row might pray 12 hours a day. They can't keep it for you. Your grandma might have so much Holy Ghost she doesn't even touch the ground. She can't keep the vision for you. You have to keep the vision. Let's all stand. I'm done preaching. I'm done with that. There's faith in the house. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. You're going to have to live out this sermon in your life. No sense running the aisles over this sermon. You're going to have to live it. You're going to have to live it. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, worship with us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road. For information about service times, church ministries, and so much more, visit us online at firstchurchclt.com. If you would like to support our efforts, text GIVE to 704-445-5353. We pray God's richest blessings to you. Come, worship with us.